this module, we'll be dealing for the second time with radicals or roots, the numbers written inside the funny little root sign, like the square root of 2 or of 16 or 100. First, we'll be looking at some fractions like these with radicals in the denominator, and we'll want to get those radicals out of the denominators without changing the value of the fractions. In other words, we'll learn how to simplify these expressions. To do that, you'll have to remember two things. The first is easy. You'll have to remember that any number over itself, that is, divided by itself, is equal to 1. Simple. The second thing to remember is how to manipulate radicals. We saw a few of the right ways to do it in the other module on radicals. Test yourself now and see if you remember how to simplify an expression by adding or subtracting like terms. Use this example to work on and come back as soon as you have your answer. I look for like terms. I find them and combine them. The two square root of x terms go together, and the two square root of 5 terms go together to give me my final answer. That's as far as I can go, and it certainly wasn't difficult. Now see if you can handle the other kind of manipulation we saw in that module, multiplying out by using the distributive law or by using FOIL, which is a little more elaborate. See if you can handle this example before I do. I find four steps in multiplying this one out using FOIL. The first terms, the outside terms, the inside terms, and the last terms, F-O-I-L. The second and third terms in the answer are plus and minus of the same thing, so they cancel each other out. And then at the end, I notice the square root of 5 times itself. And that gives me a plain old 5, which leaves me only a step away from my final answer, negative 41. In the other module, we also saw two other laws for simplifying radicals. Take a look at this expression. How would you simplify it? Obviously, you could separate numerator and denominator the way we saw a moment ago. And then the square root of x squared is pretty obvious. It's x. But that leaves us with a radical in the denominator. And there are times when you absolutely do not want a radical in the denominator, so we're going to handle that. First, let me remind you once again that any number or expression divided by itself is equal to 1. Clear enough? So, what if we took that problem expression of ours with the radical in the denominator where we don't want it and multiplied it by 1? Would it hurt anything? No. Would it change anything? Not really. So let's do it, but let's use a special kind of 1. We'll make it by putting the radical we want to move on both top and bottom. 
it's still the same as 1, but it lets us do some multiplying. And look what we get. On top, we get the square root of 3 times x. In either order, it doesn't matter. But on the bottom, the square root of 3 times itself is equal to 3. And we've done it. We've removed the radical in the denominator and replaced it with a rational number. This process is called rationalizing the denominator of a fraction. Once it's been simplified like this and has no radical remaining in the denominator, a fraction is said to be in its simplest radical form. The process isn't hard. Try it yourself on this one. I know I'm going to multiply by 1. What kind of a 1? The kind I make by dividing the radical by itself. Same number, top and bottom. That gives me the fraction in its simplest radical form. And it's easy. Well, not always so easy. Sometimes the radical in the denominator is part of a longer expression. In that case, a plus or minus sign spells trouble. Why? Well, let's see. We put the radical over itself, multiply as usual, and get our answer. But we still have a radical in the denominator. Maybe we used the wrong form of 1 to multiply. Maybe we should have put the whole expression, 3 plus the square root of x, over itself and multiplied. Nope, that won't work either. Multiply it out if you like and you'll still find a radical in the denominator. We need another bright idea. And we have one. The expression we want to change is 3 plus the square root of x. Putting that expression over itself doesn't work. But what if we tried the same thing with the sign changed? a minus instead of a plus. Let's try it. We use the distributive law on the numerator and get 15 minus 5 times the square root of x. We use FOIL on the denominator and get two middle terms which cancel each other out. And finally, no radicals in the denominator. We've done it. We've rationalized the denominator and found the simplest radical form of this fraction. Not bad for just changing a sign. When you stop to think about it, we've been using the same process for a long time, but we called it the difference of two squares factoring earlier, and we didn't use it on radicals before. Now you have two different ways to rationalize a denominator. When the denominator has only one term, put that term on top and bottom and multiply. When the denominator has two terms, put the whole expression on both top and bottom, but be sure to change the sign in the middle, and then multiply. These two methods will give you what you want, a fraction whose denominator no longer has a radical in it. Here's one that does have a radical in the denominator. Pick the right method now to get rid of it.
As always, I have to multiply by one, that is, by a fraction which is the same on top and bottom. Since I find two terms in the denominator of this fraction, I have to change the minus sign to a plus and then multiply top and bottom. The two middle terms in the denominator cancel each other out and disappear, leaving no radicals in the denominator at all. Two words of warning about our answer here. First, if you're tempted to do something to simplify that 10x squared and 25x squared, don't. You might want to divide both by 5x squared, for example, but you can't do that when either expression contains a plus or minus sign. So just leave it alone. Second, you might be worried about that 2 square root of 7 x combination. Since it's all multiplication, you can write them in any order you want. That's your commutative law. Need more information about rationalizing radicals? You'll find it in your textbook. Along with more problems to play with until you're sure you're in control of the whole process. Now I want to take a minute to talk about exponents. They're actually rather closely related to radicals, as we'll see in a moment. We've already seen positive and negative exponents and several rules for dealing with them. A positive exponent n, for example, as a power of x, means that many occurrences of x all multiplied together. A negative exponent is just another way of saying, write a 1 over the positive expression. We've seen three rules for handling exponents. For multiplying, for dividing, and for getting exponents of exponents. You'll recall that we used those rules to find the meaning of a negative exponent in the first place. And the same rules gave us the meaning of exponent zero. Now we'll use them to find the meaning of this expression. X to the power of one half seems to mean nothing at all. But one of the rules tells us that we can multiply x to the power of one half by itself by adding the two exponents. That gives us an exponent of one, or just plain x. But that means that x to the power of one half acts in exactly the same way as the square root of x. So the two are just different ways of saying the same thing and we have successfully defined x to the power of one-half. Suddenly, we see a very close relationship between exponents and radicals, which means, of course, that we're free to handle expressions like these with any appropriate rule for exponents or for radicals. Now, let's take a quick look at a general definition of what a fractional exponent means and then a few examples of how you might use it. The definition gives us something called an nth root of x. That is, copies multiplied together give us back just x. Study the definition carefully now. Be sure it makes sense to you. And then let's look at a few examples from among the hundreds of ways you might use this in various math courses. In this example, we have a cube root because it's eight to the power of one third instead of one half as before. Here we have a two on the bottom, so it's a square root again. But the numerator of the exponent is five so we have to take the whole thing to the fifth power to get our answer. Notice that we use the same exponent rules as before in every case. Sometimes we choose between them for the one that works best. Here is eight to the power of five thirds.
And here it is again. Different method. Same answer. Enough for now. The applications of this definition are endless. You'll be using it again and again. Good luck.